Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Zhang. I'm a senior law advisor at International Institute for Sustainable Development, ISD. Thank you very much for joining us today for the latest episode of ISD's webinar on investment law and policy. Uh, for those of you joining the webinar first time, a quick introduction of ISD. We are an independent international think tank championing solutions to our planet's greatest sustainable challenges. Through research, analysis, and knowledge sharing, we identify and champion sustainable solutions that make a difference. You can find more about our work at our website, isd.org slash investment. But with the help of our colleagues and many partners in the past two years, we have been hosting a webinar series on investment law and policy. This is a series uh, mainly designed for negotiators and officials involved in investment disputes. Experts, academics, and practitioners who specialize in international investment law and policy will discuss a range of issues arising in investment negotiations and dispute settlements. Today, we're very fortunate to bring together three distinguished experts in the area of investment and human rights law to discuss the interaction between these two important areas of international law and some of the recent development in the area. But before we move on to the exciting discussions, I would just like to mention a few housekeeping matters. Throughout the webinar, to ensure the quality, except for the speakers, all other participants will be muted. So if you would like to make a comment or raise a question, please use the chat box function at the bottom of your screen, or you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At the end of this webinar, we'll leave about 20 minutes for Q&A, but please do not hesitate to send in your comments or questions whenever you feel like to. When submitting questions, please kindly indicate your name and affiliation, and also um, the panelists you would like to address your question to. Uh, once we received the, the question at, at the Q&A session, I'll first read out the question and then let the panelists to share their thoughts. Okay, so with that, um, let's start the webinar today. Um, over the years, investment arbitral tribunals have expanded the scope of application of investment agreements and interpreted the obligations of state widely. In large part, they have done this in isolation from other international law. This has contributed to an increased fragmentation of the international legal framework governing transnational investment activities. On the other hand, in recent years, we have seen increasing discussions at national, regional, and global level to address human rights abuses resulted from cross-border investment activities. In this webinar, we'll look at the interlinkages between international investment law and international human rights law and we'll explore the synergies between the two areas and what this could mean for a harmonized international legal and governance framework that supports sustainable development. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Jesse Coleman, from Columbia Center for Sustainable uh, Investment, CCSI. At CCSI, her work focuses on the nexus of international investment and human rights law, sustainable investments in land and agriculture, and investment law and policy. Jesse, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Joe. And thanks to Joe and Sophia for organizing this webinar and many thanks to all those joining us today. Uh, before I get going, can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Great. Okay, so as Joe mentioned, my name is Jesse Coleman and I work with the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, or CCSI. We're a joint applied research center of the Earth Institute and Columbia Law School, and our focus is on the governance of international investment, and in particular on aligning laws, policies, and practices with sustainable development, including human rights obligations. Next slide, please. So I'll focus on the first of these two points. How does international human rights law interact with international investment law? 
and I'll focus on whether and how human rights issues have arisen in investor state disputes and investment treaties. My colleague Brooke Guven will then speak to the second point. Have human rights issues arisen in the context of multilateral reform discussions? Next slide, please. I'll start with some framing points about the nature of the interaction between international human rights and investment law. So as we all know, states with obligations under international investment law also have binding obligations under international human rights law. And while these two regimes or subsystems of law may not inherently conflict, the obligations that arise from these regimes can at times collide or compete in specific circumstances. And I think a critical point to note in this regard is that the incentives or repercussions at play for different stakeholders can result in investment obligations effectively prevailing over human rights obligations in practice. The lack of clarity for stakeholders in the investment regime around how this challenge of competing obligations should be addressed can result in investment obligations being interpreted and applied in isolation and can therefore further fragment the public international legal system. Human rights authorities have provided guidance on this question of the interaction between human rights and investment obligations. And I think Kinda will cover some of this guidance shortly, but at least in the sort of sphere of investment treaties and investor state arbitration, this guidance has unfortunately yet to kind of gain the traction that it should have gained. Next slide, please. So tensions between human rights and investment obligations create a range of challenges for states. A far reaching challenge concerns the restriction placed by the investment regime on the regulatory space required by host states to comply with their human rights obligations. Measures or actions taken by governments to comply with or advance human rights, environmental or other obligations or public interest priorities have been challenged by investors. Some examples are listed on the slide, but there are of course many others. In many cases, measures aren't actually challenged in a claim. A threat to challenge a measure may be sufficient for that measure to be abandoned or diluted. And that too, of course, is a restriction of a state's ability to advance human rights and sustainable development objectives. Next slide, please. Another concern that's relevant when considering the impact of investment law on states' human rights obligations is the impact of the regime on individuals or groups who are affected by the investments underlying the disputes. ISDS excludes third parties from meaningfully participating in disputes that can and have affected their rights and interests. ISDS also risks undermining legal proceedings that third parties pursue to obtain remedies outside the ISDS system. For example, at the domestic level in the host state. There is also some indication that ISDS and the investor protections it strongly enforces create incentives or send signals that encourage the criminalization and repression of human rights defenders. Next slide, please. So what are the entry points for international human rights law in investor state disputes? International human rights law can be invoked by investors as claimants, host state respondents, non-disputing third parties in amicus curiae submissions, or non-disputing state parties. Human rights issues can also arise as part of the factual background relevant to a dispute. And more broadly, international human rights law is also relevant for the interpretation of investment treaty standards, even when claims, defenses, counterclaims, and so forth are not grounded in international human rights law specifically. Next slide, please. In practice, however, while human rights issues are relevant in the context of investment disputes, and although these legal entry points exist, these issues are rarely or adequately considered in investment disputes. In the rare, although arguably growing instances where they are considered, the divergent approaches adopted by investment tribunals once again underscore the need for reform of investment law to sufficiently address human rights issues. In some cases, tribunals have sidestepped 
consideration of the consequences that arise from competing obligations, concluding simply that states can just comply with both sets of obligations. In others, tribunals have been found to be more responsive to human rights argumentation when advanced by investor claimants. And in others, still tribunals have diverged on the very relevance or applicability of human rights law. Next slide, please. And I won't go into detail on these cases because of time constraints, but these three cases just illustrate that divergence. In the first case where human rights law was invoked by the claimant, the tribunal relied quite heavily on human rights law in making um, its determination with respect to a particular standard. In the second case, the tribunal accepted part of an argument but rejected um, the respondent's reliance on particular treaties. And in the third case, um, non-disputing third parties sought to raise human rights issues and rely on human rights law in an amicus submission. And the tribunal in that case really didn't think that those issues fell within the scope of the dispute. Next slide, please. So how are states' human rights obligations and investors' human rights obligations or responsibilities reflected in human rights treaties? Explicit references to the words human rights within the text of investment treaties are extremely rare, even in what are referred to as the new generation agreements. A 2008 OECD study of publicly available treaties found only one example of an explicit acknowledgement of human rights obligations of states in an existing treaty. A 2014 study, also done by the OECD, then found that only 0.5% of the 2,107 treaties included in that study contained references to human rights. A majority of those references fell within the preambles of those agreements. And I believe that that study covered about 70% of the global stock of treaties at the time. In recent years, there's been a slight improvement in newer agreements and models, um, but references remain rare and in most cases, insufficient to clarify the interaction between human rights and investment law. And we'll look at some um, examples now. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a provision on corporate social responsibility. It refers to the human rights of those affected by the investment, which is admittedly quite rare. Investors are the subjects of the provision, but it adopts a best efforts approach, so it's not um, mandatory in nature. Next slide, please. This is from the recently uh, approved Dutch model, and it explicitly refers to access to revenue for those affected by business-related human rights abuse. Um, it mirrors principle 25 of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, so it seeks to reaffirm that within the text of the treaty um, or within the text of the model rather. But it's not so clear uh, what the exact consequences of this provision are, at least within the four corners of the model. Next slide, please. Also from the Dutch model comes this provision regarding the behavior of the investor. Um, it's a unique provision, though I think it raises questions about whether non-compliance with the responsibility to respect um, and the OECD guidelines should be dealt with at the damages phase or whether treaty protection should be conditioned on compliance. Next slide, please. Article 15 of the Morocco-Nigeria BIT deals with alignment of laws and policies with human rights obligations, um, which is again quite rare. It's not totally clear from the agreement whether there will be, for example, monitoring of its implementation or cooperation between states around this objective. Next slide, please. This example comes from a model agreement and it explicitly includes measures a state party deems necessary for the protection of human rights within the scope of the treaty's general exception. Um, it requires the measures to be necessary, which is still a high bar, but it is self-judging. Next slide, please. 
uh, the key message with respect to all of these new generation provisions is that it's critical to really investigate and assess their effectiveness. And some of the questions to consider when doing so, though there are many others, include um, do provisions clarify the interaction between state obligations under investment and human rights law? Do they protect host state measures adopted to comply with human rights obligations? What signals do they send to investors, states, and others? Do they incentivize or undermine responsible business conduct? And do they address pressures and incentives that can result in investment obligations taking precedence over human rights obligations in practice? Um, I think much more is needed in this regard than we've seen in recent years to align investment frameworks with human rights obligations and sustainable development objectives. And I think Brooke and Kinda will speak further to that. Lastly, for those interested, this primer covers the interaction between government obligations in greater detail. So I'll turn it over to Brooke now. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks, Jesse. This is Brooke Gubin. Um, I'm a colleague of Jesse's at CCSI. Uh, and I will, uh, if we could go to the next slide talk about um, how and to what extent human rights issues have arisen in the context of multilateral reform discussions. And a lot of the references are to sustainable development. So that's um, a lot of how I'll speak to this, but um, I think the realization of human rights also um, would include the advancement of sustainable development objectives. So I speak about them sort of interchangeably uh, in some cases. So I will talk, uh, next slide please quickly about the ICSID rule reform process, because that seems to be on a lot of people's radar and a lot of people are participating in it. And then I'll go into more depth on the UNCTRAL Working Group 3 reform process. So with respect to ICSID, um, the ICSID rule reform process was launched in 2016, and this is the fourth amendment to the ICSID arbitration rules. So far, there have been three rounds of working papers that have been published by the ICSID Secretariat, and it's an iterative process. So um, the, the working paper is published, they receive comments and other input, which are all on their website. Uh, and then a further working paper is published for further discussion and potential revision. Um, so the objectives of this process are to modernize the ICSID arbitration rules, to simplify them and make them more user friendly, to make the proceedings more time and cost effective, to reduce the use of paper through e-filings and the like, and to maintain due process and a balance between the disputing parties. So this is um, more of a narrow reform process looking specifically at the procedural rules of ICSID and doesn't reach into the treaties themselves, obviously, or to broader ISDS reform. But nonetheless, there are some important um, things happening. So for example, ICSID is looking looking at reforming uh, the rules surrounding transparency of third party funding, uh, looking at rules surrounding under what circumstances um, and what, what circumstances should impact decisions on costs and security for costs. There are uh, improved sort of arbitrator declarations as to conflict of interest. And then they're also looking at improving the transparency of exit awards and documents related to the proceedings. Um, uh, however, I, I would note that these don't actually go as far as the Mauritius Convention, which is already in force. So these proposed changes are really not intended to and don't really address sort of the broader um, conflicts that Jesse spoke to uh, between and about IAAs and ISDS. Um, but I did just want to flag that quickly. Next slide, please. So the, um, the other reform, multilateral reform process that's going on is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Laws Working Group 3. So the, the UNCTRAL uh, Commission is made up of 60 UN member states and it has six technical working groups that advance the objectives of the commission. So Working Group 3 has been charged with a broad mandate to work on the possible reform of investor state dispute settlement. So this process is supposed to benefit from the expertise of all stakeholders. It's a government-led process. Uh, it, it moves forward on a consensus basis and it's fully transparent. So I've highlighted some things in bold here that are particularly important. The first is that it's a broad mandate, which means that there's no predetermined reform agenda. 
So states participating in this process have the freedom to frame that agenda and to work on reform solutions. And uh, while it's a government-led process, it is benefiting from expertise from a wider variety of stakeholders. So various civil society organizations, academics, arbitral institutions, practitioners have been invited to participate in the UNC trial process and to help um, raise issues related to, uh, raise issues and solutions related to ISDS reform. Uh, it's consensus based and within working group three, um, the Secretariat is moving forward on a full consensus basis. So of all participating states, not merely those 60 UN or, or commission members. So all states have the ability to frame and, and Im have input onto this agenda. And then it's transparent. So submissions, uh, the audio, the reports from the sessions are all on the working groups website. Um, next slide, please. So the working group is moving through a three phase mandate. Phase one is to identify and consider concerns about ISDS. Phase two is to consider whether reform is desirable and phase three is to develop solutions. So the working group has recently moved into phase three and I'll discuss that in a bit more depth later. Um, but I do wanna note that phase one does not close. So to the extent a state were to identify a concern about ISDS that has not yet been considered, that would be open for further discussion, even though the working group is in phase three. Um, so the working group with respect to its reform solutions, uh, first it, it will take account of other uh, ongoing reform efforts. So for example, ICSID is working on advancing an arbitrator code of conduct. Um, and it's been noted within the working group that it would be ideal to align these two pro uh, processes with respect to, for example, that issue. Um, and then uh, UNCTRAL, unlike other um, international uh, sort of multilateral efforts, is not a binding process. So each state will have the ability to determine whether and to what extent it will decide to adopt the reform solution. Next slide, please. Uh, so notably, the working group has interpreted its mandate to be that of procedural elements of ISDS, not looking at substantive provisions of investment law. So for example, the working group will be tackling things like the independence and impartiality of arbitrators, but will not be looking at precise, for example, formulations of the fair and equitable treatment clause. Um, it is worth noting that in submissions and interventions in the working group, several states have reiterated that reform of ISDS uh, will require addressing substantive provisions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but right now that is not within the mandate. Uh, although in the future, if the working group did decide to go back to the commission and request that it, it may be, but right now that's outside of its scope. Um, next slide, please. So the identified concerns um, are consistency, coherence, predictability, and correctness of arbitral decisions. Uh, concerns have been identified about arbitrators and decision makers. So for example, uh, putting into place a code of conduct or ethics or looking at how they're appointed um, uh, qualifications. The cost and duration of ISDS cases is a concern, and then third-party funding is a concern. So all of these are advancing onto um, reform solutions. Next slide, please. And then there have been these other issues that have been raised by various states, which have been noted by the Secretariat and by the working group as not rising to the level of concerns that I addressed in the previous slide, but issues that should be guiding principles and incorporated into reform solutions. So these include things that go more to some of the sustainable development and human rights issues um, that come up in ISDS. So for example, um, the extent to which ISDS, uh, uh, you know, is, contributes to regulatory chill or looking at investor obligations and counterclaims. Um, in particular, looking at the implications of ISDS disputes for third parties and third party participation, uh, looking to whether investors should be required to exhaust local remedies, uh, 
uh, looking at dispute prevention and alternative dispute resolution processes, and then also damages, which in many ways, to the extent they impact fiscal space of uh, host country governments, are very much a human rights issue. So these are procedural mechanisms, um, which is within the scope of UNCTRAL's working group three, that are now being addressed within that working group. And they may be a way to gear some of the reform solutions toward sustainable development objectives. So next slide, please. Um, and a wide variety of states within the working group have been referring to sustainable development as an overarching orientation that ISDS reform should be looking toward. So for example, the G77 and China opened two sessions of UNCTRAL with a prepared statement, the first paragraph of which in each case was the group of 77 and China attach, attach great importance to the improvement of the global investment environment in a way that encourages fairness and promotes investment policies that are in line with the three pillars of sustainable development. Next slide, please. Uh, and other uh, groups and individuals have also submitted to the working group um, and have reiterated that international investment and the work of UNCTRAL is indeed a critical element of advancing the SDGs and human rights and that UNCTRAL's very mandate is linked to this goal. So a group of UN special, special procedures mandate holders wrote a letter to UNCTRAL uh, in March of this year calling for fundamental reform of the ISDS system. They, um, they noted that the purpose of UNCTRAL, as established by the General Assembly, is to promote the progressive harmonization and unification of trade law in furtherance of the UN Charter, and that this implies um, that UNCTRAL should be pursuing greater cooperation in economic and social fields and respect for human rights. Next slide, please. Various observer organizations have also um, made submissions to the working group to, with the objective of assisting the working group in achieving sustainable development oriented outcomes. So I've put the website of the observer submissions on the top. It's on the homepage of UNCTRAL's working group three, but it <laughs> can be a little bit harder to find. Um, it's the online resources link, but the website is on the top and, and the, I, I've just taken a screenshot of some of the submissions that have been made. And I'm going to talk about three in particular that were submitted by CCSI along with IASD and IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, next slide, please. So first we submitted, um, uh, made a submission on draft treaty language, looking at withdrawal of consent to arbitrate and termination of international investment agreements. So our draft treaty language is modeled on the European Union's um, termination treaty for inter-EU bits and the OECD's BEPS convention, um, which amends 3000 existing bilateral tax treaties. So we really see termination or withdrawal of consent as a critical element of sustainable development alignment because certain outdated treaties, which form the basis for a large majority of disputes are drafted and interpreted in ways that are not aligned with and, in, and can undermine um, sustainable development objectives. And indeed, this is also termination of treaties is also an element of phase two of UNCTAD's reform package for the international investment regime. So that was submitted for the working group's consideration. Next slide, please. Um, we've submitted uh, on uh, a submission on these other concerns and cross-cutting issues that I discussed before and have sort of set forth how these might be better considered and, and the ways in which they may be considered as the working group moves forward to ensure that they're integrated into reform solutions. Uh, and then next slide, please. And we've made an, a submission on the issue of third party rights and set forth certain options or considerations for reform. So the issue of third parties has been noted by several states in deliberations. And while this is often considered to be, in, and importantly so, communities or other individuals directly impacted by an investment or a dispute, it can also be banks and other creditors or subnational government entities, other entity, legal entities or, or people that have um, an interest and their rights are impacted by the dispute. So the current role for these parties is limited in most cases to amicus curiae. And this, um, 
has this role has been noted as being insufficient and indeed not intended to address the impacts of the on the rights of these parties. So there are potential reform solutions that can better consider the range of rights at stake in investment disputes. And our submission looks how at how domestic and other international courts account for third party rights. Next slide, please. So we look at three options in depth. The first is how other courts and processes enabled the participation of third parties and under what circumstances their participation is deemed desirable or necessary. The second is how other courts and processes have formulated rules as to when and under what circumstances claims must be dismissed or another more appropriate forum approached when essential third parties cannot or will not be joined to a dispute. And the third is how other courts and processes have formulated rules as to the reframing of claims, arguments, or remedies when essential third parties cannot or will not be joined. Next slide, please. Um, so UNCTAD has also set forth, uh, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, has set forth a reform package for the international investment regime. And at the, at the center of this reform package is really inclusive growth and development. Um, that should be at the heart of investment policy making in advancement of the sustainable development goals. So UNCTAD includes procedural options that can be taken to align existing treaties with sustainable development objectives. Um, so it's possible that the working group within UNCTRAL could take account of these, um, but right now is not in a concerted way. Um, and then next slide, please. At um, CCSI, we've also been thinking about what a human rights and SDG aligned investment framework would holistically look like. And we have set forth a three pronged approach. It would promote and channel investments that contribute to sustainable development and withhold benefits from those that don't. It would promote and not constrain responsible SDG advancing governance at the national level. And it would promote international cooperation to overcome transnational and collective action challenges that are related to the governance of international investment. So when looking at multilateral reform projects, and in particular UNCTRAL, it's important to ask whether it will result in outcomes that are aligned with a sustainable development-oriented approach to facilitating and governing international investment. Next slide, please. So uh, I'd just like to close with looking at UNCTRAL's current work plan. So um, in, in October, it considered a multilateral advisory center, code of conduct, and third-party funding. In January, it will look at an investment court, an appellate mechanism, and arbitrators and adjudicators. And in April, uh, we'll look at some of these other issues and other concerns that were raised by states. Um, so the, these processes are not going to be <laughs> resolved within one year. It will be an ongoing process. But um, these are those issues that will be considered for reform. So it's certain that ISDS reform of some form is going to occur, um, even though that timeline may be long, um, and it's unclear how effective it will be and whether states will opt in, but it also remains a bit unclear the extent to which these reform efforts are going to align investment governance with sustainable development and human rights obligations. So I'll now turn to Kinda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, thank you, Brooke and Jesse. Um, sorry, I didn't get a chance to introduce Brooke. Brooke Lubin is uh, also from uh, Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, CCSI. Her work focuses on uh, analyzing the contracts, domestic frameworks, and international legal arrangements governing cross-border investments and impacts that these frameworks have on sustainable uh, development objectives. So just now we heard from Jesse and Brooke, and Jesse gave us a uh, an, an overview, snapshot overview of the current practices and the um, the, the the lack of reference or um, cases where where human rights are considered in um, investment uh, object cases or even the treaty practices. And then Brooke also gave us an overview of the ongoing multilateral pro uh, reform processes um, on. Uh, on the discussion, but mostly from from what we heard, mostly the current discussions are on the procedural side, although there might be a slight possibility this can be expanded to the substantive side, but um, at, at least for now, this is not the case yet. So um, we're going to hear from Kinda uh, Mohamed Dia, who is a um, 
a senior researcher from the Third World Network, and she works on issues pertaining to in international investment governance and the role and accountability of business enterprises with respect to human rights. Uh, Kinda will sh share some insights on what we discussed, but from a human rights perspective. So let's see how um, the issue or the linkage to investment law is addressed from a human rights law perspective. Kinda, please. Thank you, Joe. Do you hear me well? Perfect. Great. Okay, so as Joe, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Joe mentioned, I would be uh, looking primarily from the side of the rights holders uh, and discussing the human rights narrative and processes pertaining to this issue of interface between international uh, investment law and international human rights law. So first slide, please. So basically, as Jesse has already mentioned, uh, the human rights uh, authorities have already uh, expressed their views and also their guidance in regards to this uh, issue of the interface between these two bodies of law. Some of the opinions I recall here on this slide, for example, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is the main authoritative body linked to the uh, Convention on these rights, uh, addressed this issue and said that negotiation and conclusion of trade and investment agreements could obstruct states from complying with their obligations under the covenant. They uh, have also explained that under their obligations, um, uh, states should identify any potential conflict between their obligations um, under the two regimes. They should undertake human rights impact assessments. They are encouraged to insert provisions explicitly referring to their human rights obligations in their uh, trade and investment treaties. And in terms of interpretation, that trade and investment treaties currently in force should take into account when being interpreted the human rights obligations of the state consistent with the uh, United Nations Charter. Another authoritative opinion was under the guiding principles on uh, business and human rights, which is the international consensual uh, document on this issue, which have uh, also addressed um, the interface and said that investment treaties may constrain states from fully implementing new human rights legislation and that states should maintain adequate domestic policy space to meet their human rights obligations when pursuing business related policy objectives, including, for example, through investment treaties or contracts. As mentioned by Brooke, several UN special procedures mandate holders and other human rights experts has also addressed these issues in their own reports. And a good list of these reports could be found in footnote number one of the letter that Brooke has spoken about, which was submitted to UNCITRAL. An interesting document as well is the Maastricht Principles, which is a, an international expert op op opinion that is restating uh, human rights law, particularly uh, in, in regards to extraterritorial obligations of states, which have also said that states might, must elaborate, interpret, and apply relevant international agreements and standards in a manner consistent with their human rights obligations. Next uh, slide, please. So, so just a, a look into uh, the, the reality today, and this is just to complement as well the picture that, um, that Jesse have uh, uh, characterized for you. So looking from the human rights uh, uh, prism, under international human rights law today, already states have an obligation to regulate the conduct of their businesses when operating in their territory or jurisdiction. So when operating domestically or in other uh, jurisdictions. But what we see that both the home and the host states of the investors uh, 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 today lack uh, uh, fulfillment of uh, this obligation. So we either see that these regulations are not in place or are not well developed. We, have, we are seeing a little bit of movement in some uh, state practice lately, and I will talk a little bit about this, but generally this uh, obligation is not uh, yet well fulfilled. So this is important, particularly if we are uh, thinking 
that in the future, the protections, for example, under uh, international investment agreements would be conditioned on compliance with human rights law. Also, it is uh, important to consider that a lot of countries at this point, they recognize that they have these obligations, but they might be uh, hesitant to take active steps in this regard, worrying about their competitive position vis-a-vis uh, -vis investors. This is why discussing this issue at the international level, at the multilateral level, might be useful in this regard and also would achieve conversions among jurisdictions. To give you one example of the latest um, developments, uh, specifically in regards to uh, setting mandatory human rights due diligence obligations on business, France has passed a law in 2017 called the French Law on Duty of, Diligence, uh, of Vigilance of Business, which is basically the duty of uh, 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 diligence. And um, it sets uh, new obligations on French companies when operating in France or abroad. So the company must set a diligence plan and uh, uh, this diligence plans should deal with the respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms, health and safety of persons and the environment. Another obligation under this law is that the uh, company should effectively implement the plan. So this is not a declaration of goodwill. They should show steps towards the effective implementation and as well publish these due diligence plans and implementation reports, which is considered a very important element uh, in order to allow civil society groups, for example, to monitor and also for the actionability of some of the elements under the law uh, uh, in terms of the implementation. So this is one uh, element of our reality. The second is that for rights holders, there is a lot of challenges when they seek their rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, violating uh, business. Particularly, they face challenges in accessing a forum, in establishing jurisdiction over their cases, including in uh, the home states of these uh, businesses, and in enforcement of judgments when they actually are able to get a, a judgment. So you can see we are in a challenging world. You can see that the investment uh, uh, regime allows, for example, shareholder companies to directly initiate legal proceedings to recover damages on behalf of their subsidiaries, but also to protect themselves from corporate veil, uh, through the corporate veil, from any potential proceedings against their subsidiaries. This is the world and the privileges of the business entity, but the victims of uh, 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 a potential, a potential victims uh, of business practice face multiple jurisdictional challenges, as we said, and uh, uh, also potentially face the counter strategies of the business through using ISDS and through starting parallel proceedings in order to frustrate their ability to uh, access a forum and uh, uh, access remedy. So we see that there is a real imbalance uh, in terms of the uh, rights and obligations and the privileges if we are looking at comparing the reality of business versus rights holders. And this is something important to consider. In respect to the availability of forums, besides the challenges of accessing uh, uh, the forum, we also see that the specialized uh, regional human rights courts that exist today have a limited uh, uh, jurisdiction usually over uh, the human rights uh, conventions that are related to that forum, not all human rights. And they also have jurisdiction usually over states and not business. And uh, the, the, the courts, uh, the human rights courts uh, today have not dealt uh, or have rarely dealt with the question of the interface between investment law and human rights law. Uh, one example we have is from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which uh, in a decision uh, against Paraguay in 2006, has basically said that obligations under bilateral investment uh, treaties cannot justify the violation of human rights. That's because Paraguay raised it as a defense uh, for the failure to enforce the uh, uh, rights to land of the petitioners. 
but but the court did not go so far at, as to establish a hierarchy of human rights over uh, investment uh, 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 treaties. So, so these are also the uh, limitations that rights holders face as well in pursuing uh, uh, their rights. Next slide, please. Another uh, part of our reality is that international human rights law does not currently set direct obligations on business enterprises. So this is an open discussion. Uh, there is no uh, conceptual barrier to agreeing on imposing direct obligations on corporations, including, for example, direct obligations under international human rights law. But this is not the case today. And this discussion is really not getting traction uh, currently. Uh, uh, so this is part of the reality. The second uh, element is that the, the hierarchy between these two bodies of law uh, lacks clarity. Um, so we have, uh, we, we have a lot of questions in, uh, in this regard. Um, the UN Charter, uh, particularly Article 103, have said that in the event of a conflict between obligations of the members of the United Nations under the Charter and their obligations un under other international agreements, that their obligations under the Charter must prevail. But then um, a lot of experts argue that the UN Charter does not entail the reference to all human rights um, and thus uh, does not create a, an overall hierarchy of human rights vis-a-vis -vis other uh, obligations that states have. But, but also there are some experts and some uh, uh, participants in this debate that, that note uh, that all human rights conventions we know today stem from the Charter, so they should be seen uh, uh, in their entirety as a collective. And, and thus, this Article 103 of the UN Charter should help us in uh, dealing with the hierarchy between these two bodies of law, but, but for sure this is still an open uh, question. The, the other element is the, the issue of how human rights have been tackled under international investment law. Jesse has said a lot about this, but for sure, we, we, for example, we do not see any exceptions under IIAs which allow states a way out of their commitments for the purpose of fulfilling human rights. And also we see that the attempts lately to bring language pertaining to the right to regulate, reasserting the right to regulate uh, under uh, investment treaties does not necessarily provide uh, like the full answer in this regard and has um, several uh, limitations. We can discuss that later maybe. The next slide, please. So I want to come to the issue of the uh, discussion on a legally binding instrument on business and human rights, uh, which is happening at the Human Rights Council. Uh, this is a, um, a discussion which is uh, stemming from a mandate that the Human Rights Council have adopted under uh, a resolution 26-9, which was voted in 2014. And this resolution established an open-ended intergovernmental working group on uh, transnational corporations and other business enterprises in order to el elaborate an internationally legal, legally binding instrument to regulate in international human rights law the activities of uh, transnational corporations and other business enterprises. So according to the latest text and till now we have uh, a, a text and a revision of it that uh, have been released by the uh, chairmanship of this process. According to the stated purpose in the last text, this uh, 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 binding instrument would um, target the strengthening of the respect, promotion, protection, and fulfillment of human rights, the uh, prevention of violations, and uh, the ensuring of effective access to remedy and justice, and the promotion and strengthening of international cooperation in this regards. So up until now, the, the discussion have been going on since 2014. We have had five annual meetings of this intergovernmental uh, uh, working group. And overall, you, we can see that the discussion focuses on procedural and jurisdictional issues pertaining to cross-border business conduct, 
uh, the clarification of existing obligations of states under international human rights law, particularly extraterritorial obligations of states and the rights of victims under international human rights law, and also the setting of new standards on mandatory human rights due diligence uh, for business. Something similar to what I uh, mentioned to you uh, have been established under the French law on a duty of a vigilance. Next slide, please. There's a lot to say about this process, but I want to focus on one element, which is the provision which seeks to address the interface between human rights and uh, economic law. So basically uh, investment and uh, trade law. So the latest text, which you can find on this link, includes a provision which says that state parties agree that any bilateral or multilateral agreements including regional or sub-regional agreements on issues relevant to this instrument or its protocols shall be compatible and shall be interpreted in accordance with their obligations under this instrument and, in proto and its protocols. Uh, the previous version of this text uh, was more direct in, in terms of tackling the trade and investment agreements and I also copy the text for you here. And it proposed that state parties agree that any future trade and investment agreement they negotiate shall not contain any provisions that conflict with the implementation of this convention and that all existing and future agreements shall be interpreted in a way that is least restrictive on their ability to respect and ensure their obligations under this convention. For sure, the standards proposed to deal with the interface have been um, discussed uh, uh, length on a lengthy basis um, but but if I go back to the latest text so the one uh, up uh, article 12 12.6 uh, this language seems very similar to me to language which has been already agreed under the WHO framework convention on tobacco control which uh, provides that the uh, the provisions of the convention the FCTC shall in no way affect the right of parties to enter into bilateral or multilateral agreements, provided that such agreements are compatible with their obligations under this convention, which deals with the uh, right uh, to health as well. So, so, so broadly, if we want to uh, look at uh, this discussion, one of the ma main underlying questions is the extent to which we can deal with the interface between international in human rights law and international investment and trade law through a human rights instrument. And what are the potentialities and limitations in this regard? So the discussion thus far in the working group on the legally binding instrument on business and human rights indicates that there is an understanding at least that an international human rights instrument cannot replace a reform process that is already underway and hopefully will be progressing in the realm of uh, reforming uh, the, the uh, investment and trade regime and uh, including, for example, uh, renegotiating some treaties or amending some treaties. So that needs to be uh, happening. But what this instrument, human rights instruments could add is potentially an enabling environment that allows states to further align their commitments under trade and investment treaties with their human rights uh, obligations. So if we look at, um, if we take one example, um, if we want to deal with the existing treaties, so what, what this language tells us that the existing treaties shall be interpreted in accordance with the obligations under the human rights uh, treaty. So basically this will, takes us back, will, will take us back to the, um, the role of the arbitral tribunals which oversee or basically are in uh, control today of the interpretation and the application of these uh, uh, treaties. And it is exactly there, uh, according as well to what uh, Jesse has uh, explained, it is exactly there where the policy space of states is uh, potentially challenged or carved out, carved out uh, 
So, so, so we really need to think in, in this regard, to what extent uh, reliance should be on uh, arbitral uh, tribunals uh, in this regard. And also we should uh, think uh, uh, of what we need to learn from the practice of the arbitral tribunals thus far when dealing with human rights issues. So, so Jesse has told us that there has been different approaches by different tribunals to this issue. But when, arbit uh, when arbitrators have um, accepted to uh, look at uh, human rights issues, for example, in cases where states have raised human rights as part of their uh, defense, we have seen that tribunals have often been reluctant to diagnose a real conflict between investment and trade law and human rights law on the other uh, hand. So, for example, uh, the case against Argentina in 2010, which had to do with the, uh, the supply of water and the right to water, the Vivendi versus Argentina case. The tribunal said there, as a response as well to Argentina raising the issue of the, uh, its obligation vis-a-vis -vis the fulfillment of the uh, right to water, the tribunal said that Argentina is subject to both international obligations, that under human rights law and that under the investment treaty, and must respect them equally, that Argentina's human rights obligations and it, its investment treaty obligations are not inconsistent, not contradictory, or mutually exclusive. Thus, Argentina could have respected both obligations, according to the tribunal. So this brings us to think about whether it is enough to set standards under an international human rights uh, uh, treaty, which requires com uh, a compatibility of trade and human, uh, 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 trade and investment uh, agreements and human rights obligations, or which requires interpretation of these investment agreements in accordance to human rights. I think there, there is a lot of, uh, 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 of elements that needs to be discussed in that regard. And maybe we need to rethink those standards in order to capture more clearly the, uh, the objective we want, which is that trade and investment agreements should not be interpreted in a manner that undermine the capacity of states to implement their human rights obligations. So there's a lot there that needs to be addressed. And for sure, there is a lot of limitations to the answers um, that could be uh, um, provided through a human rights treaty. I would conclude, and if, if you please, the next, uh, next slide. Oh yeah, that's the last slide, great. So, so I would conclude by putting these issues for consideration and discussion, and that is beyond as well the realm of this legally binding instrument and, uh, on business and human rights, but for sure taking it into consideration. One uh, issue to think about is the importance of clarifying in domestic laws, both of home and host states of investors, the obligations that they have as derived from international human rights law. This would be very important in order to substantiate the reference to domestic law and human rights law under investment treaties. And it will be also very important in order to clarify grounds based on which rights holders could pursue their rights. The other element that would be important to consider is the, um, the, the, how we could coordinate the solutions that could emerge from both sides of this interface, the solutions that could, we could find under international investment law itself and those that we can find under human rights law, such as uh, under the legally binding instrument on business and human rights. Uh, uh, because, because in the end, it is not sufficient uh, uh, to uh, only think from one uh, side of uh, this interface, and we need more coordination between uh, the developments on both sides of this, uh, of this world. Uh, another element which I already uh, posed for you for your consideration is how much arbitral tribunals are equipped to contribute to mending the gap that we face today, and whether uh, that could potentially uh, 
their role could potentially lead to more fragmentation. And also, maybe we need to think about the kind of additional spaces that we need in order to nurture more exchange among the communities that are dealing with these two bodies of law, because often both at the national level and at the international level, these communities do not interact as much as needed and their language remains parallel uh, uh, language and often uh, it remains uh, alien uh, uh, to each other. So this is another a point for consideration. I thank you. Thank you, Kinda. Um, thank you, Kinda. Um, I so um, now thanks um, for Kinda's uh, presentation and give us the overview from the human rights perspective. Um, now we're at the Q&A section and we have about 15 minutes for Q&As from uh, the participants. And uh, so please type in uh, your questions via the chat box or using the Q&A functions. As you can see from the screen, there's an the instruction on how to do that. Um, we have received one question um, from Juan Herrera. Sorry if I uh, pronounce your name uh, incorrectly. It's uh, Juan Herrera from uh, Ecuador. Is a private practitioner and his question is uh, addressed to Kingda. So he asks, um, it seems that uh, Kingda sees a hierarchy in which the international human rights law is on top of investment law. Considering that there is no such hierarchy unless we see the norms of jus cogens, um, how can you propose such hierarchy? I guess it's a question about supremacy uh, in the human rights question. I don't know if uh, Kinda you would like to address this now? Sure. Thanks a lot for this question. Um, I actually did not present my point of view in this regard, but I, uh, I, uh, my point was that there is lack of clarity and for sure it is a, a much debated issue. I do agree with you that for now what we know is that it's only Ruskogans or the core human rights such as prohibition of torture or prohibition of slavery that have this kind of uh, um, status vis-a-vis -vis other uh, international uh, uh, law. But this is a, a discussion that is ongoing for sure in the um, in the discussion on the legally binding instrument on business and human rights, some of the participants are proposing that there should be provisions in this future instrument that actually establish this hierarchy because they do consider that the, there is enough under the UN Charter Article 1 or, uh, or 3 to, uh, in order to allow uh, a state to establish that uh, uh, hierarchy uh, through an international human rights instrument. I, uh, I do not uh, totally agree with this. Uh, I, I do see the uh, value of uh, restating uh, the, uh, the need uh, at least for uh, finding more clarity and I do see the value of a provision such as the one that I reviewed for you, which is needed exactly because there is not this hierarchy already established. Uh, uh, but, but, but definitely it would be useful, I think, for um, investment law practitioners to give their point of view uh, uh, in this debate, which is evolving at least in the human rights, uh, 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 among the human rights community and in this circle, which is addressing the issue of the legally binding instrument on business and human rights. Uh, thank you. Um, our next question coming from uh, Ludovica Chusi, a, a postdoc research fellow at the University of Bologna and visiting fellow at uh, CCSI. Um, so the question actually goes to all the panelists. So uh, 
it seems that a common challenge for international human rights law and international investment law is the potential abuse of the corporate structure in order to avoid liability for human rights violations or to gain protection of the investment. Now, investment tribunals have sometimes resorted to this um, abuse of such rights to, dismi to dismiss claims brought by the investor. Um, so do you envisage any role of the international investment law in fostering the idea that corporate structure cannot be employed with the aim that is different from the original purpose that is to fostering entrepreneurship within the rule of the game? And a uh, particular question addressing to Kinga, um, do you see the, the treaty, I, I guess, uh, the, it was referring to the, the binding treaty of human rights and business, um, would require to go, for, for that treaty to, uh, the negotiation of the treaty to be successful, does that require reform of the corporate law? Would you like me to uh, answer or do you want to give the floor to CCSI for the first part? So, uh, Jesse Burke, if you would like to address the question. Colleague, <laughs> CCSI. Uh, sure, yeah, I can, I can jump in. Um, and and I, I'll uh, maybe ask Jesse to jump in after me. This is Brooke. Um, so one thing uh, with respect to corporate structure that is on the table, at least at UNCTRAL, and then I'll let Jesse talk to some developments in actual um, bilateral and multilateral treaties. Um, but with respect to an actual multilateral reform effort is the effort to address the issue of um, reflective loss and other shareholder claims. So trying to limit the extent to which, um, well, so if you, if you look at domestic legal systems, um, you know, indirect shareholders cannot make claims for loss directly at the company level. Um, they can make claims for things like sh violation of their rights as shareholders, but not, um, not to a corporate, corporate loss um, in the same way that a direct um, shareholder, majority shareholder could, uh, or with the, in the way that the company could, sorry. So, so one thing that's on the table um, that the OECD has been doing quite a bit of work on is looking at ways to limit, um, and this is still under development, but looking at ways to limit who can claim for what kinds of loss. Um, and in some ways that could also um, help to constrain some of the problems we're seeing and some of the fragmentation we're seeing in investment law. Um, and could also, one, one other thing that, that states have been looking at is ways to prevent disputes. And I think that, you know, when you have this system where indirect and multiple indirect shareholders can, can claim for the same loss, um, it does create a lot of problems for uh, respondent states. So, so that's sort of a, a side note of, <laughs> of the question, but that is something that UNCTRAL is planning to look at in April. Um, and then Jesse, I don't know, do you wanna talk about um, treaty yeah. developments? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. I think, the, I think that the, the recently approved Dutch model tries to address this in some way, um, but kind of building on the, the point that Brooke mentioned about a multilateral um, framework convention, it's really more of a collective action problem because it's, hard to address in individual treaties. So it's, it's an example of a, another one of these issues that if states were to come together and try to address it collectively, it could be a more effective way um, of getting to the root of the, of the issue. Um, and for policymakers and government officials who are involved in investment approval processes, it's a really complex um, problem and issue for them to face. So I think in kind of reflecting on, on what a multilateral approach could achieve. I think this is a really critical issue to think about. Um, maybe I will add uh, in regards to the question particularly pertaining to the legally binding instrument uh, and uh, corporate law. So, so the discussion is going towards finding alternative avenues uh, to um, 
uh, to dealing with uh, corporate uh, civil liability besides piercing the corporate veil or besides opening the whole discussion about uh, the need to rethink corporate law. So the, the, the approach of the, um, of the proposed treaty, at least as reflected in the existing text, is that the uh, civil liability of a corporation for the actions and harms uh, undertaken by another, like for example, the civil liability of a parent company uh, in, in the case of a harm caused by its subsidiary, would uh, be based on uh, the uh, grounds of its direct liability and not uh, its indirect liability, which would require piercing the corporate veil. So uh, in order to look at their direct liability, uh, the direct liability of the parent company, there uh, would be the need to uh, investigate its control over the activities that led to the harm. So it's basically looking at what the parent company did directly as, for example, decisions that would have entailed the or uh, um, uh, would have uh, uh, um, had an impact or uh, dealt directly with the action that the subsidiary did and which led to the harm. So the element of control is one of the elements which is considered as basis for establishing such liability. The other element is the uh, foreseeability of the risk in the conduct of uh, 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 these, um, uh, uh, its business activities. So the, its business activities, the, the business activities that it directly uh, undertakes. So this is, this is uh, kind of, I think a way out, uh, like trying to find a way out, um, alternative to the messy uh, grounds of piercing the corporate veil or uh, uh, the whole discussion about the relevance of corporate law as we uh, know it today. But this is as well uh, very much uh, based on the latest uh, jurisprudence of some countries like the United Kingdom, and I think there's other cases in Canada and Australia, which have dealt with the relationship of parent subsidiary uh, um, and, and the liability in these uh, cases, and which have looked at the, uh, the duty of care of the parent company directly, and thus looked at what, what the, uh, the uh, parent company uh, was supposed to do, or has declared that it would do, and how it did not fulfill that, and uh, used that as a grounds to uh, establish its direct liability for some uh, kind of uh, uh, harm that have uh, erupted at the subsidiary level. So this is a very interesting approach, uh, and uh, it is worth further, uh, I think, uh, investigation on, on how it could be adopted in an international human rights instrument. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, that way, we just received a series of other questions um, from the panel here, but I realize we only have two minutes left. So I'm just going to um, raise those questions and I'll ask the panelists to, um, with, with uh, keeping those questions in mind and try to finish the, your, your uh, intervention in the next two or three minutes, so one minute each. So um, there, 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 there are a question from uh, Luis Bertier asking about the counterclaims. Do you think counterclaims can be relevant to, to enforce uh, investor obligations? And then there is a question from um, Eleni Gariel about, uh, um, do you think the termination of intra-EU bits will lead the investors to European Court of Human Rights. Um, what's the relationship between there? Um, and then there is a question uh, uh, from Indonesia about uh, um, what do you see 
the 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 interlinkage between uh, investment law and the ILO regulations, the labor law uh, regulations. Um, and then also there's a question about the investment cases that actually uh, uh, actual uh, were, were showing an actual conflict between um, international investment law and the goal of sustainable development. So I guess the, the, the thing is, the, the question is asking if the current uh, framework of international investment law is it along the line of sustainable development or is it actually contradicting to the goal of sustainable development? So with that in mind, um, I'll just give the floor to our panelists and let them to wrap up. Um, maybe we can start from Jesse. Sure, they're all great questions. I will not be able to address all of them in a minute, um, but maybe I'll address that last question first. I think the, it's, it's um, the kind of the key message of all three presentations is that, that the investment framework as we currently see it is, is not so aligned with sustainable development and human rights. Um, objectives and, and obligations. So I think we have a lot of uh, work left to do. Um, I think I will also try and address Eleni's question as well. Um, I think if inter-EU bits were to be terminated or are terminated, um, it could lead to, to more cases being referred to um, the European Court of Human Rights and that sort of may lead to more to to the evolution of the interaction between investment and human rights. So I don't know, it would kind of be a, might be a section of, of the cases that we're currently seeing and might be issues kind of relating to denial of justice and, and a specific subsection of the property rights issues that we're seeing, but um, it could be an, an interesting evolution. And CCSI has a paper that deals specifically with this issue that looks at kind of the various alternatives that currently exist to the ISDS system, including um, existing human rights courts. So we can share that with anyone who is uh, interested. So maybe I'll turn it over to, um, to the other panelists. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is Brooke. I could talk a little bit about counterclaims. Um, so this is something we're seeing in new treaties uh, and a lot of, there are advantages to counterclaims. So procedural efficiency and, you know, they're, they're then highly enforceable through the exit of New York conventions. And it sort of um, uh, relieves a bit the asymmetry in the current, uh, in under most current treaties where, where investors don't have obligations. There are some things that should be given consideration if counterclaims and investor obligations are to be incorporated to a greater extent in investment law. So I think some of them would be that the tribunal um, now may be tasked, depending on the origin of the, of the obligation, um, with interpreting domestic law um, or with respect to other legal issues. So for example, environmental or social issues. And that's not to say that um, a tribunal uh, isn't already dealing with those issues, but just, you know, sort of when we're thinking about who are arbitrators and who is interpreting which law, uh, it's something to consider and whether there should be a place for domestic uh, courts. Um, so for the, for example, to the extent an ISDS tribunal is pronouncing on a novel issue of first impression under a domestic law, would there and should there be a role for domestic courts? Under the current system, there's no way for the state to appeal that decision. Um, so, so there's a question there. Costs may be higher rather than, you know, if, if something were litigated domestically. Um, I would note that many counterclaims, particularly those of an environmental nature, are highly and can be highly interrelated with rights of non-parties who currently don't have a role in the system, which we, we discussed. Um, so, you know, extra care may need to be given to ensuring that their rights are not negatively impacted. And then finally, I think to the extent counterclaims are settled in the ISDS context, uh, domestic legal systems have many protections um, and transparency relating to when and under what circumstances governments can settle claims with private claimants. Um, and an ISDS has none of those protections. And we have a paper on that as well. Um, and that's not to say there aren't solutions or it's not a good way to start thinking about 
reform of the system, but um, certainly care should be given to address some of these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. Um, Kim, that one minute. Yeah, thanks. So maybe just in regards to the question on labor laws. So in the discussion about um, business and human rights, usually the uh, like the core conventions of the ILO are considered part of the uh, body of law that uh, is being addressed. And at least in the discussion in, in regards to the legally binding instrument on business and human rights, there's an understanding that the the, uh, the the labor laws should be uh, covered and there is no uh, th there is uh, no argument against that at least uh, uh, from what i know uh, so so for sure the global value chains and liability within global value chains is a major issue for consideration in this regards particularly the uh, uh, ob obligation of parents vis-a-vis -vis their subsidiaries and suppliers uh, so that obligation uh, would be the human rights due diligence obligation which uh, entails taking certain action uh, in support of subsidiaries and suppliers in order to uh, take precautionary measure and avoid potential violation of human rights or uh, harm to uh, uh, communities that are affected by that uh, practice. But also the other element of consideration when it comes to global value chains is how liability, in case there is a violation that happens uh, or a harm that results, how the liability for that would be um, extended throughout the uh, value chain because now we see that when uh, a, a problem happens the liability uh, for example in a developing country where a subsidiary of a big uh, 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 multinational is operating the liability falls on that subsidiary and usually those subsidiaries could be uh, with uh, limited finance available to them in order to in, invest in uh, infrastructure uh, that uh, is needed to uh, uh, for, to fulfill the human rights uh, uh, due diligence etc so one of the things to consider is how to deal with the uh, civil liability of uh, uh, parent companies vis-a-vis -vis as well the actions of their subsidiaries and suppliers where they have control over these actions so where they are able to exert that control so this is an evolving uh, uh, area of work and i think thank it you. would be one yeah. of the most important elements in the legally binding instrument thanks yeah thanks kinda so um sorry that we have to cut it short here that uh and, and i understand there's still some open questions uh in the in the q a panel that we we weren't able to address, but uh, um, after the session here, we're going to post all the slides online at a, the, the, the website page, and we're going to later upload uh, the recording of this webinar for uh, public access, and you will find, uh, you will be able to contact uh, the speakers uh, for any remaining questions you might have. Well, thank you very much again for this very engaging session. And I hope you find it very helpful. Uh, we'll see you next time.